up until now, we have talked a lot about the landmarks of the brain, but not so much about what actually happens within or around them. It turns out that to process the world around us and ourselves, the brain is divided into distinct functional regions that sometimes process very specialized bits of information or sometimes integrate information from different areas to create complex cognitive functions. What I want to do now, now that we have surveyed the different sulci and gyri, is to go over the most notable functional units of the brain and very briefly discuss what they do to get an idea of how the brain is organized. Obviously, our more detailed conversation about these areas will come in their respective contexts. The first type of cortical areas that the brain has are sensory areas. These areas include the somatosensory areas, the auditory areas, the visual areas, and the piriform cortex, which is the principal cortical area to process the sense of smell. For the somatosensory, auditory, and visual areas, there is an important principle by which the brain processes sensory information. That principle is the idea of division of labor and functional hierarchy. The most striking and well-studied example happens in the visual areas, which are all primarily located in the occipital lobe. The cortical areas representing the visual areas can be broadly divided into the striate and extra striate cortex. The striate cortex represents the first stage of visual processing and processes somewhat crude information from the eye, such as the orientation of visual input. Then, this information is passed down to extra striate areas, so outside of the striate cortex, to process and integrate more complex aspects of vision, such as movement and more complex shapes. A very similar idea occurs in the auditory areas, where you can first find the primary auditory cortex, and then secondary areas that process more complex auditory information. A well-known example of a downstream auditory area is Wernicke's area, which is primarily responsible for the comprehension of speech. In the somatosensory system, which is responsible for processing our somatic sensations like touch, pain, temperature, and proprioception, it also has primary and secondary areas that process different levels of complexity for a given sense. By the way, note that the primary somatosensory cortex is located in the postcentral gyrus. Now, the second type of cortical area that the brain possesses are the motor areas. The motor areas are all pretty much located in the frontal lobe and mediate the planning, control, and execution of voluntary movements. Similarly to the sensory areas, the different motor areas of the brain mediate different components of movements and are hierarchically organized. The primary motor cortex, which is located in the precentral gyrus, is considered to be the main output region for motor commands, but the planning and control of movements happens mostly in nearby regions called the premotor cortex and supplementary motor area. Two interesting areas that are part of the premotor cortex are the frontal eye fields, which contribute to proper eye movements, and Broca's area in the inferior frontal gyrus, which is often considered to be responsible for proper speech production. As a side note, through different dissections and imaging studies, it became well known that Broca's and Wernicke's area were connected together to properly mediate speech. The interesting part about this is that if one of these areas is to be damaged, then speech gets impaired in different ways. Such conditions are called either Broca's aphasia or Wernicke's aphasia, depending on where the damage is. Since Broca's area is a motor area and thus responsible for the motor output, Broca's aphasia produces a speech that is hardly understandable because the motor output is impaired and the person has a hard time saying the words. Nonetheless, although patients with Broca's aphasia have a very impaired fluency, their understanding of what is being said to them remains intact. On the other hand, Wernicke's area mediates speech comprehension, and when it is damaged in cases of Wernicke's aphasia, the patients can speak fluently because their Broca's area is intact, but the meaning or the semantics of what they say is usually nonsensical. In addition to that, patients with Wernicke's aphasia have trouble with understanding what is being said to them. These two neurological disorders exemplify very well the idea that the brain is divided into different functional units that communicate with each other to process different cognitive functions. Now, with the main sensory and motor cortical areas covered, you will notice that much of the cortex still remains undescribed. If you recall the beginning of our discussion on the brain, you might remember that the brain and the central nervous system as a whole does much more than simply perceiving and responding to the environment. In between the perception of the world and the output of our actions, 
Much of the brain area is devoted to performing complex and integrative cognitive functions that do not necessarily materialize in front of our eyes. These areas that perform these integrative functions are called association cortices, and each lobe except the occipital one is mostly made up of that. The most notable example of this is the frontal association cortex. In essence, this region of the brain is one of the most important factors that makes us humans as it processes our working memory, which is our ability to temporarily keep information in our minds, it processes our emotions, and various executive functions such as our ability for reasoning, attention, planning, decision-making, and many more. In the temporal lobe, the temporal association cortex is primarily known for its ability to mediate object recognition and memory due to its close proximity to the hippocampus. In the parietal lobe, the parietal association cortex integrates from all the senses and it is known to mediate our awareness of our bodies, many spatial functions, and also our ability to read and write language. Even with these descriptors, note that each association cortex mediates much more. The last functional region that I want to point out in this diagram is the limbic system, which can be best seen on the medial surface. The limbic system is a complex circuit of different structures that mediates our emotions, some forms of learning and memory, our sexual behaviors, and many more. Some notable structures that participate in this circuit include the cortical regions of the limbic lobe, so the cingulate and parahippocampal gyrus, the medial and orbital frontal cortex, the amygdala, the thalamus, and the hypothalamus. In this diagram, the brain can obviously be further subdivided into more precise functional areas, but what we have should suffice for us to get the gist of how the brain is believed to work, which is the idea that it is divided into many functional subunits that process relatively simple to very complex information, and they all communicate in some way with each other to create a unified perception of the world. From this discussion, you might have noticed that in the sensory areas, we have not covered where the sense of taste gets processed, and that is because it is hidden in the external surface view. To find where this area is located, we need to take a look inside of the lateral or sylvian fissure to discover an important cortical region of the brain called the insula. We can also appreciate the structure of the insula from a cross section. As you can see, the insula represents a substantial amount of gray matter, and it is thus important to discuss. The area of the insula spans somewhat essentially the length of the sylvian fissure, and thus processes many functions. To name a few, the insula is responsible for housing the gustatory cortex, it is also reportedly responsible for our sense of self-awareness, our visceral sensations, and homeostatic control and our ability to process emotions such as compassion and empathy. Because of its hidden nature, there is an anatomical term called the operculum that represents the cortex overlaying the insular cortex. We can find a piece of operculum in the frontal, parietal, and temporal lobes. In the cross section, the operculum are shown as the following. With the content that we have covered up until now, we have built ourselves a very good intuition on how the brain is organized, both functionally and structurally, but our intuition only holds from the point of view of the external surface, as we didn't discuss much of what's going on inside the brain. Accordingly, I want to take a moment now to survey the locations and functions of some of the most notable structures that are hidden within the brain for us to get a complete overview of the main functional units. Since these structures are buried inside a cortex, they are also known as subcortical structures. To observe most of these important subcortical structures, I want to consider two views. First, the mid-sagittal view of the brain that we are used to seeing, and secondly, a cross-section of the brain at this anterior level. To situate yourself in the cross-section, imagine we are looking at the brain from this direction and the frontal portion is removed. Now, if we start with the mid-sagittal view, we can orient ourselves by pointing out some structures we are already familiar with starting at the surface where we will find the cortex. In terms of its function, it's kind of hard to describe what the cortex does because it will always feel reductive, but in essence, the cortex integrates information for us to perceive, feel, and act on the environment that surrounds us. Another area that is kind of hard to functionally summarize is the brainstem, which, as it is implied in its name, is located at the base of the brain. The brainstem has three general divisions, the medulla, the pons, and the midbrain. And altogether, they mediate a bunch of different functions, but mainly, they are involved in the homeostasis or balance of the body, the senses and the motor activity of the face and viscera, 
and the brainstem also has a wide variety of projections that go throughout the brain to participate in different circuits that influence our cognitive states. For more information about the brainstem, make sure to consult our discussion on it, where I elaborate much further on what happens there. Right next to the brainstem, we can also see the cerebellum, which, as we will cover in its respective video, interacts with the rest of the central nervous system to help mediate and coordinate movements. It is also involved in motor learning and other cognitive abilities such as language and memory. As such, many projections go in and out of the cerebellum to interact with the spinal cord, brainstem, and cortex. Now, for the next two subcortical structures, you might remember their location from when we covered the anatomy of the brainstem. The two structures in question, the thalamus and the hypothalamus, are both part of the diencephalon, which is located rostrally with respect to the midbrain. In terms of their function, the two are very complex, so again, a short description might not make justice to the full extent of their roles. In essence, the hypothalamus is mostly known for its involvement in our hormonal regulation via its connections to the endocrine system, but it also mediates a wide variety of functions including regulating our sleep and the homeostasis of our body. In another discussion, I plan on covering the different divisions that make up the hypothalamus, and it contains many different nuclei that perform many different functions. Likewise for the thalamus, it is essentially an egg-shaped ball of mostly gray matter that contains more than 50 known nuclei, which, as you might guess, mediate different roles depending on which nuclei we are referring to. The one commonality that most of these nuclei have, and contribute to the main function of the thalamus, is that they all receive some type of input and then communicate information with the cortex. As such, the thalamus is involved in communications across the entire cortex and participates to diverse aspects of cognition. One thing I want to quickly address with respect to the function of the thalamus is that some of its most popular divisions are those that specifically relay certain types of information to the neocortex. For example, it contains a few sensory nuclei that relay, for instance, visual information from the eye to the primary visual cortex, or information from the ears that passes through the brainstem to the primary auditory cortex, and as such, the thalamus has been labeled as a relay station. However, the thalamus is much more complex. Beyond sending information to the sensory areas, it also communicates with association cortices that mediate much more complex functions. These types of signals that come out of the thalamus are called feed-forward because in terms of hierarchy, the neocortex is above the thalamus and as such, it feeds forwards to the top. In terms of its processing, it has been found that the thalamus acts as a gatekeeper for information, so the feed-forward connections from the thalamus should not be seen as mere relays, but more integrative in nature. Additionally, the thalamus receives an incredible amount of feedback projections from pretty much the majority of the neocortex, and this element too adds an additional level of complexity to the thalamus. The next important structure that I want to point out is the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia is a collection, or circuit of nuclei, that work together to control movement initiation. This circuit is also involved in some forms of implicit memory, habit learning, as well as other diverse aspects of cognition. Most of the components of the basal ganglia can be best appreciated in the cross-section, where we can find the caudate nucleus, the putamen, and the globus pallidus. In addition to that, the basal ganglia is also composed out of the substantia nigra, which is a particular nucleus in the midbrain that we came across in our discussion on the brainstem. The basal ganglia contains other structures that participate in its circuit, but these should suffice for us to get an idea of where the basal ganglia is located. In this current cross-section, we can also see another important group of nuclei called the amygdala. The amygdala is a structure we have already encountered when we talked about the functional anatomy of the cortex, and it was an important component of the limbic system. Through various lesion and imaging studies, it was discovered that the amygdala is involved in memory, emotions, fear, anxiety, decision-making, and many more functions of that nature. Now, as of yet, our discussion on the different structures of the brain has mostly focused on the gray matter, but the brain has also some important white matter structures that we need to consider. The most prominent and well-known white matter tract in the brain is called the corpus callosum, and it is located here. The main function of the corpus callosum is to provide a pathway for the two hemispheres to exchange information. This can be best observed in the cross-section, where we can see the corpus callosum directly bridge the left and right hemispheres. 
In the cross-section, there are a few other important white matter pathways that we can point out. First, there is the anterior commissure, which connects the two temporal lobes. Then, we can also find the internal capsule, which is an important bilateral white matter pathway that connects the cortex with the brainstem, spinal cord, and other subcortical structures. On the lateral side of the putamen and globus pallidus, we can also find the external capsule, which carries cortical-cortical association fibers. Here, cortical-cortical simply means that it carries information from one region of the cortex to another region of the cortex. The final subcortical structure that I want to point out is the hippocampus, but to see it we need to consider a more posterior cross-section at the level of the thalamus. The hippocampus will be located in this medial region, and in terms of its function, it is mostly known for its involvement in diverse aspects of memory. The output of the hippocampus is then carried out by a white matter tract called the fornix, which is located ventral to the corpus callosum. This last bit of information should be enough for us to understand the main functions of the different subcortical structures. Alright, now that we have an idea of how the cortex is divided, let's consider what happens inside the gray matter to make all of this possible. To get us started on how our knowledge of the cortex came about, I want to first consider some of the different staining techniques that have been developed over time to visualize neurons. Thank you for watching this video. If there was anything unclear or there was a mistake somewhere in the video, make sure to let me know in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, you can consider leaving a like and subscribing to support the channel. On the right, you will see the informational resources that I've used to produce this video. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you in our next discussion.